Tony de la Pena, and I'm really happy to be at VR Days as a hologram with you all. So let me tell you a little bit more about myself. A friend of mine was working on a book chapter, and he interviewed me, and he asked OpenAI for a little bit of assistance, you know, artificial intelligence. What could they get wrong? And so he asked about my awards, and it said I won the MacArthur Genius Award, which gives you five years at $150,000 a year to do whatever you want. And then I won a Peabody Award, and then I won an Emmy Award. Well, it turns out the AI was wrong. The AI lied. The only award it actually won was the Peabody. And when he asked the open AI to help him with the transcript, it started making up stuff in our conversation. I changed the subject, which sometimes I can do rather quickly. You got to keep up. But the AI couldn't keep up. It started saying this really weird stuff about how I was broke and I went on a road trip and I decided to hold a benefit concert. Honestly, this was out of a transcript of an interview. So... Who am I really? The real VR pioneer, Noni de la Peña. What if I could present you a story that you remember with your entire body and not just with your mind? So what'd you think? Oh, you're crying. With VR, virtual reality, I can put you on scene in the middle of the story. You get this whole body sensation. There's a bunch of cops here. They're like standing around. Something's going on. Oh, right here. Oh, that's not cool. On the other side of a fence, there's all these people just like kicking and beating. We can have what I call the duality of presence, a real feeling as if you are in the middle of something that you normally see on TV news. So I started applying all these ideas to what I named immersive journalism. And we all know being there is the most important part of understanding almost anything that's happening. Along in a partnership with America's premier investigative documentary series, Frontline, we had incredible access on solitary confinement cells. What that is, is photogrammetry. And it's exact photographs of a cell you are walking around the exact cell, the exact footprint. You are in the room. This works so well for putting people on scene at real stories. So then what? You gotta put the people in there. How do you do that? I can now put you in the room with somebody who is videotaped in volume. You can literally walk around them in a volumetric way. Emblematic is among the world's leading producers of virtual and augmented reality, with more than 10 years of experience. We create innovative, high-impact, immersive media, ranging from emotionally powerful stories for media companies, brands, and global culture, to OTT solutions for world-class partners and business-to-business -business virtual reality distribution. Let your audience experience your message in a deeply powerful and intimate experience. Don't just tell your story, live it. So as somebody who has pioneered the use of virtual reality for something that I've been calling immersive journalism, you know, what's the background here? Well, Martha Gellhorn called what we journalists do the view from the ground, right? And uh, I was a correspondent for Newsweek, and like one of the cover stories I did, I. I put myself inside a crack den over 24 hours. And from there, I tried to explain to people what it was like to be there, to be on the ground in that situation. Well, when I made Hunger in Los Angeles, I was trying to do the same thing. Basically, Hunger in LA tells the story of a man with diabetes waiting this long line for food, doesn't get food in time, and he collapses into a diabetic coma. And it uses real audio from this crazy scenario that happens that day, when in the middle of the chaos, somebody tries to steal food, etc. And basically, I made this whole scene with uh, characters who were borrowed and, and uh, uh, bought from different stores, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in order to you know, make something for 700 bucks of my own money. Um, and this is an example of how we had to use motion capture. The same guy, John Brennan, an incredibly talented Wasp character, Idol, who O2, played to every no, no, character no, no, four, uh, in ready. that entire scenario. He had to play the woman running the food bank, He had to play the woman who was running the food bank. He had to play uh, the children. 
Every single character John played in that mocap suit. We had the mocap stage overnight, and that was when we had to do the entire piece. And of course, that got into the Sundance Film Festival in 2012. And uh, when we showed up there, we only had this one crazy set of headset, the Wide 5. It was $50,000 a pair. And the head of the lab basically said, you can't take that with you. So um, we had to make headsets, and that's me working with uh, the team and uh, the black dots on the screen there are, you know, where are the pupils? Where should your eyes be? And I have a skinny head, and that dude had a big fat head, and we showed up with these crazy 3D printed goggles. But opening night uh, was extraordinary. We really didn't know how people were going to react, and yet, like, it was examples like this. So, what'd you think? Right? And of course, uh, with us at that point was Palmer Lucky, crashed in my hotel room, driving the truck back, and nine months later he started Oculus Rift and uh, sold it to what is now Meta, for better or for worse. In any case, that, that sense, that feeling of being there, how else did I use this? I use this in stories that really intended to try to create an impact. Forty percent of homeless youth come from the LGBTQ community because they've been thrown out from their homes due to their sexual orientation. After I gave my talk at TED Women, the actress Sada Ramirez approached me and she really wanted to make this piece about homelessness in the LGBTQ community. In collaboration with the True Colors Fund, I was lucky enough to begin working with them on finding the right material to tell the story. We ended up using the audio of Daniel Pierce who was thrown up by his own family, and he happened to record the terrible confrontation that ensues. Oh, get off of me! What's wrong with you? Bring it! What's wrong with you? So by putting the audience in the middle of this physical moment, you know, using the motion capture, putting on digital characters, and then making it life-size so it happens all around you, it's so startling. Suddenly this thing you've heard, which is disturbing enough, um, and maybe you've watched videos of this type of scene, but if it's there and you feel physically vulnerable, you connect to Daniel and to what he's going through in a way that um, I don't think any other medium affords. It, it, it is a really significant and powerful moment to be there with Daniel when, when he's that vulnerable, when he's surrounded by people who hate him just for being who he is. You're twisting my words. You are you a complete. You everybody. You are words. a completely different person. Let me tell you something. You're a But we also use new technologies, uh, something called volumetric capture, which is with a company called 8i, in which we film from every direction around a person, and it creates a hologram. And we use that moment, that technology, as kind of a postscript to offer messages of, messages of hope be able to uh, give people some ideas of, you know, how you can get to the other side. So I'm personally also really excited about using haptics for VR. Uh, and we're going to be ordering a Tesla suit uh, to arrive really soon. And I can't wait to tell you what it's like once we start playing with it. But I want to talk about, you know, how extraordinary this kind of technologies can be used in ways you might not have thought of. This is a young woman who's trying to clear her uh, phlegm, the kind of buildup that comes with cystic fibrosis. She has to wear this weird vest that pumps her chest so that it can break up all this stuff. Well, now with B Haptic's vest, she can actually listen to music and get the same kind of frequencies that will do the work without her have to be sit there and be tortured by this item. And imagine if you added VR stories to this, what kind of good you could do. Um, now you start to say, well, how am I going to afford to make some things like this? Well, now we've got AI creating 3D objects. You're saying, oh, I want a boat or a rhino or a giraffe or an elephant or a motorcycle. And the AI will spit out these 3D models. A lot of companies getting this. I think NVIDIA just announced a new uh, uh, way to do uh, AI models. Um, and if you need some help with your writing, well, there's also these AI screenwriting tools that have come out. I'm sure a lot of people here have started to play with Midjourney. You know, uh, uh, Midjourney is one of the AI tools that makes art for you. You put in things like Donald Trump in space with alien hyper-detailed, and you get this. 
But you have to be a little bit careful, right? You're looking at all these. It becomes like Happy Child and Anime Girl and Sweetie and, you know, Smart One, Well-Behaved Child, all white, all white. So you have to be really careful. Amazon discovered that when they used AI to try to uh, get rid of gender bias in applicants, they found that AI kept letting men through and not women. And why? Because the data was saying, look for the words capture and execute. And Moon weren't putting that on their resumes. That said, some really beautiful and interesting things are coming out of AI. This is a friend of mine who's been making a, a game about White Rabbit, and this art now is so astonishing. Similarly, people were designing characters and then asking the AI to put the characters in different environments so that they can start to actually storyboard out really beautiful spaces. Um, and of course, we're starting to see, you know, what are going to be the holograms in that space, and uh, this is how come I'm allowed to be here this way. But uh, I also want to deal with a good other AI sort of uh, interesting uh, use cases. This is actually somebody in a headset, and the AI is changing their living room as they turn their head. So the images are actually changing uh, in real time. So this is a, a, going to be very interesting in thinking about how are we going to change, what, you know, what is going to be the AI? How are we going to marry holograms? What's going to happen to the holograms in real time alongside AI? Uh, this company, Fineki, uh, is actually making video from text to video. So in this case, asking for a teddy bear to come from underwater and march up onto the beach. Uh, pretty astonishing stuff. So as we know, making real-time technology is hard. I've lived through this. So I've tried to make something, a tool, that can make it easier for anybody to start to create. And that's why I've designed Reach.Love. You can take a look at try it at Reach.Love. You can sign up. This is probably my first time I've announced it publicly. So I'm really excited to say, please sign up and test it and report bugs for me, OK? Try.Reach.Love. So what is it? It's a SaaS authoring tool that lets anybody create stuff and then publish it just like YouTube, right? It's button-based, it's WebXR, and you don't have to actually know how to code. Um, and you, when you publish it, you can either just send somebody a link or you can literally embed it just like a YouTube video. And then people can move through the space, right? Headset optional. They can either use their WASDI keys or arrow keys, they can use their phone, they can use a tablet, or of course, they can walk around with a VR headset. So this is a tool that I'm really excited about. And how did I use it? Well, I did this piece on a guy who was put in one of the American Japanese uh, concentration camps. He was actually a Japanese American guy. We, we set up all these concentration camps during World War II, if you didn't know that, for our own Japanese American citizens. And this guy was an incredible artist and a thinker. And so we made this piece about him, and we put a trailer uh, in The Guardian because they interviewed me. And um, this shows you how we were able to actually embed a trailer from the Hayami Project straight into the newspaper's website, right? And people could just click on it, and then they can use their keyboards to move through the space. They can look around. Um, and that you're doing right there is a photogrammetry of an actual barracks where um, Stanley and his family had to live in this tiny little space, right? And then, of course, if you hit the VR button, you're going to be able to walk around with full uh, immersion in a headset, right? So that's a, and uh, by the way, this got 45,000 views in just uh, two days. So I've been scanning lots of stuff, um, and I want to tell you about my latest uh, endeavor at ASU. So one of the most exciting things I'm getting to do right now is I've joined Arizona State University, and their whole mandate, their whole charter is we're measured by who we include, not who we exclude, right? And, uh, you know, of course, I'm out there with my phone scanning their charter. But basically, I'm based in downtown Los Angeles, even though Arizona, obviously, is its own state. We've created a whole space here to be more inclusive in California. Um, and uh, I'm jointly between film school and journalism school here. Um, and because Arizona has the largest number of first-generation students, uh, the largest number of indigenous and incredibly inexpensive uh, degrees, um, I decided I could come here and help change the demographics of who's learning, working, teaching in these kind of spaces. Um, and in L.A., it's just, you know, a place where you can have real, true global impact. Um, and the students here are having an amazing time. Um, 
And I want to tell you about our, the five tiers of my program, and I'd love people to join me in any part of this journey. The first is we have a graduate degree. We have our first cohort now. Um, they're extraordinary students, and I've been really lucky to have this uh, both as a way to start to teach and give back, but also to learn myself how to become uh, a better program. Secondly, uh, we uh, are having a lab, at what I call a institute for the body, and the idea that we privilege the body, we think about embodiment uh, throughout research and, and, and what we construct. We're also working on a haptics lab. How can we let people feel stories as much as see and hear them? Um, and how can we let people who, uh, sh you know, want to be included in this process, give them the tools to tell their stories? We have an extraordinary event space. And finally, I want to say we're thinking about policy. How can we literally change governmental approaches to technology? For example, in a, uh, most of America, we have these boards, a water board, an education board. Um, but we need a technology board because it's become a basic right. So um, I'm going to finish up there. And thank you so much for, for uh, listening to me as a hologram. And please never feel afraid to reach out if you have any questions about anything I do. Thank you.